Allah'ın temelinde siyah bir anlığına sebeplerine çakşu onun idam yiyene hızma işi gülüleyine bana hukam koloti baç olan hamdun hamdun ayetiye gönül yaz kripa tama hamdun deyişi gülüm yiyatarına nama on bişnü kadaya kışna kıstaya bu tale şimati bakti vidantı suamın itinamini namaste sarasvati devi gavulvani pıçarini Nirmeshesha Shanyavari Bhastachari Satarane Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Vaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaurana Bhaktarana Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna Hare Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama Hare So yesterday I asked you to please stop me if I start introducing the topic. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, yet this morning I was thinking so before I get to Bhaktiloka there was something else I wanted to just to follow up on from yesterday's presentation. <laughs> It just somehow these these two references popped into my mind, and I thought it would be so fitting to put them in now before beginning Bhakti Loka. And uh, if you remember. Yesterday I was speaking about uh, these topics uh, about controlling the urge to speak and uh, avoiding pajalpa. They're not new topics. And they've been covered by previous acharyas. And most of my introduction yesterday was about the fact that Bhakti Vinod Thakur had covered these topics quite detailed in, in his essays. And then uh, I mentioned that Srila Prabhupada spoke about it, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur spoke about it. Of course, Srila Rupa Goswami spoke about it because it's right there. Atyahara Priyasas Chapa Jalpa Niya Magaha. So, uh, <coughs> there are a lot of references to this topic. And if I wanted to find examples from Srila Prabhupada, it would probably be a, a whole book on the topic. <coughs> and there is, as we said, a lot of statements made by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. <coughs> But two particular references immediately popped into my mind and I wanted to... I won't read them all, I'll try to summarize them. Because if I read them, it will turn into the whole class and we still won't get the Shibhakti Loka. <laughs> Even this one letter from Srila Prabhupada, I've given two classes on, just the, on the one letter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we could be potentially treading on dangerous waters if I, <laughs> if I start speaking. <laughs> But I really do want to get to Bhakti Loka. <laughs> my, my phone is telling me don't go there because my phone won't open now. 
<gülüyor> Telefonum da oraya gitmediyor çünkü şimdi açılmıyor. What's happening here? Oh, there it is. <gülüyor> it uh, this is a letter. This letter, this letter Prabhupada wrote to a disciple. And uh, he was addressing a specific point about uh, uh, fault finding. And uh, he's talking about u- utopians. Because uh, there was a conception by the devotees who were finding fault that that Krishna consciousness should be like utopia. <coughs> and uh, which is of course the most ideal place, utopia. <coughs> and uh, they were finding that it wasn't utopia at all. <laughs> and they were pointing out different faults so much what they observed in their experiences. And Prabhupada was saying, no, there will always be faults. And he said, there are even faults in the spiritual world. And he gave different examples about faults that exist in the spiritual world. He gave an example that just like once Krishna was so bewildered by the attractive features of Radharani, he began milking a bull. And uh, he said, just like the gopis, when they heard Krishna's flute, they began running into the forest, and the gopis had put their clothes on in the wrong places, and and their their mascara in the wrong places, and and he said they put what was supposed to go on the bottom, on the top, and what was supposed to go on the top, on the bottom, so a lot of faults there. <laughs> and he said that even there is envy in the spiritual world. And he said that in the spiritual world, although envy is there, there's never any malice. You know what malice is? Mm-hmm. Because uh, although we always say that, in fact, Narutam Das Thakur says that lust, anger, greed, bewilderment, these things can be dovetailed for Krishna's service. Sorry, that was a little long, wasn't it? No. Okay, all right. There is six whips with lust, anger, greed, bewilderment, and envy is also included in the list. And lust and anger and all these, they can all be dovetailed for Krishna's service. But he said that anger, I mean envy, can never be dovetailed. <gülüyor> you can tell bewilderment, you can tell anger, anger, you become angry at those who are offensive to devotees. But envy, you can't say, I'm going to use my envy for Krishna's service. You just can't use envy for Krishna's service. But there's, but there's envy in the spiritual world. But there's difference between envy in the spiritual world and envy in this world. In this world, there's always malice. And it means that we want to see others 
at a disadvantage so that I could be at an advantage. And in buradaki hasret başkalarının kötü bir durumda olmasını istiyorum ki ben iyi bir durumda olabilirim. So I can be better, I can push others down. Bu şekilde daha iyi olabilirim ben ve diğerlerini ezdirebilirim. The spiritual world no such thoughts exist. Spiritual reality düşünce lan yok. And in fact, I think there's even an example in the nectar of devotion where Prabhupada gives Rupa Goswami one example that one gopi, uh, Krishna was painting the lines on a gopi on her forehead. And one, and one gopi was saying, just see, Krishna's lines are perfect. That means he's not agitated at all while he's painting these lines. <laughs> you know, it's pointing that out to say, oh, he's not so attracted to you, but, but he, he can't hold his hand steady. <laughs> so, this is an example given in Nectar of Devotion about envy in the spiritual world. But it's all for Krishna's pleasure. <coughs> but in the material world, it's all envy is uh, due to our own conditioning. So Prabhupada was, I'm trying to summarize the letter. <laughs> to put things into perspective about what Prabhupada is talking about here. So um, now I've, uh, I've summarized some of the parts of the letter. So Prabhupada says here, so sometimes when one gopi would serve Krishna very nicely, the others would say, Oh, she has done so nicely. Let me do better for pleasing Krishna. That is envy. But it is transcendental without malice. So we shall not expect that anywhere there is any utopia. Rather, that is impersonalism. People should not expect that even in the Krishna consciousness society there will be utopia. Because devotees are persons, therefore there will always be some lack. But the difference is that is that they're lacking. Because they have given up everything to serve Krishna. Money, jobs, reputation, wealth. Big educations. Everything to serve Krishna. Whatever lackings they have are become have become transcendental. Because despite everything they may do, their topmost intention is to serve Krishna. So Prabhupada is explaining that the devotees, we should be very careful not to find fault with devotees. He said, because there's always, there will always be some lack because we are persons. Devotees of Krishna are the most exalted persons on this planet. Better than kings. All of them. Should we, so we should always remember that. And like the bumblebee, always look for the nectar or the best qualities of a person. 
Yani aynı bir çiçek babarısı gibi hep bir insandaki en iyi nitelikleri bulmaya çalışmalıyız. Not like the utopians who are like the flies. Who always go to the open source. Or find the faults in a person. Because they cannot find any utopia. Or because they cannot find anyone without faults. They want to become void, merge, nothing. They think that is utopia. To become void of personality. So if there are sometimes slight disagreements between devotees, it is not due to impersonalism. But it is because they are persons. And such disagreements should not be taken very seriously. The devotee is always pessimistic about the material world. But he is very optimistic about spiritual life. So in this way you should consider that anyone engaged in Krishna's service is always the best person. This is a lot there. I mean, as I said, I've given two classes on this one letter, but I just wanted to give this as an example. Prabhupada had to deal with it too. <laughs> Why did he deal with it? Because people were saying so many things, bad things about other devotees. And they, they had, and Prabhupada was explaining, no, we should not look, for, we should not be like the flies going to the stores. <coughs> We should be like the bees who go to the nectar. There's another quote from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And this one's very cutting. <laughs> but he was addressing the same point. He was addressing the point about people who like to find faults. And he was specifically saying that, yes, we should find faults. For those who are envious of devotees. And he was speaking about this in reference to the quote that I just gave from Naratam Das Thakur. That a devotee should become angry when he sees others are envious and causing harm to devotees. He can dub his anger for Krishna's service. But Hanuman, Hanuman dovetailed his anger for Krishna's service. And Prabhupada once said, Arjuna had to do that too. How could Arjuna fight in the battlefield and not be angry? Imagine, imagine being in a battlefield, having to fight against so many opposing army, opposing armies, a big Maharaja, and being, I'm not angry. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna, Krishna was correcting Arjuna because he was too passive. <laughs> you have to be angry for Krishna's service. <laughs> So, in the beginning of the letter, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur says, yes, it is okay to be angry when others are envious or causing harm to Vaishnavas. 
Evet diyor bir Adana'nın kıskanıldığı ne ona zarar verdiğini gördüğümüzde öfkelenmek iyi bir şeydir. But he says, but before that we have to see whether we ourselves are envious of devotees. Ama buna bakmalıyız. Önce biz kendimiz Adana'nın kıskanıyoruz, ona bakmalıyız. Whether we ourselves are actually serving Krishna. Or are we serving something else on the pretext of serving Krishna? How much are we attached to Krishna? Are we trying to enjoy the objects meant for Krishna's enjoyment? And then he says, I think my enjoyment prone material body is fiercely uh, is that not so easy. My I think my enjoyment prone. You know what that means? Prone. Yeah, pen, prone. Pen, pen. In, tendency. <laughs> yeah. I think my enjoyment prone material body is fiercely envious of Krishna and the devotees. So then Because instead of thinking constantly of Krishna's lotus feet and ha- and happiness I am busy worrying about my own happiness blaspheming others and looking for faults. I do not look at myself at all. I am such an offender at the feet of devotees that I should first learn to display anger toward myself. I am so envious of devotees that I should beat myself with shoes simply to purify myself. Then I can set an example for others. And sincerely engage in the service of Hari Guru and the Vaishnavas. I must remember that everyone is worshiping Hari but me. I am unable to do so. I should also remember that I may die at any moment. So first we should show anger toward our own sinful propensities. Such as our desire for profit, adoration and distinction, and our, and our propensity to cheat others. We must correct ourselves first. Otherwise, we cannot correct others. Then we have to correct those who are related to us. Who are envious of the spiritual master and Krishna. And who are pulling us toward material enjoyment by tempting us. This is the secret of success. Very strong words. <laughs> And we just yesterday we were talking about how we have to somehow we have to build a, some kind of a mechani- internal mechanism to restrain ourselves when the tendency is to find fault and speak about somebody. Başkasını suçlamak ve başkaları hakkında konuşmak için böyle bir eğilim hissettiğimizde kendi içimizde böyle bir yani bizi kısıtlayabilecek bir içsel mekanizma da oluşması gerekiyor. So we need these words of the previous acharyas to give us the strength. Ve bizim daha önceki acharyaların sözlerine ihtiyacımız var bu gücü bulabilmek için. Because sometimes we forget that we act very impulsively. Çünkü bazen unutuyoruz ve çok tepkisel bir şekilde davranıyoruz. And we don't think what damage we're doing to others and to ourselves by our impulsive tongue. Every morning we say before we take prasadam that how the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. 
Yani her gün biz preşerde omurlandırmadan önce, preşerde omurlandırmadan önce bunu söylüyoruz. Yani dilin kontrol etmesinin ne kadar zor olduğunu söylüyoruz. Very difficult to conquer the tongue in this world. Yani bu dünyada dili kontrol etmek çok zor. Hmm. So tongue is two businesses, is honoring preşerim and uh, glorifying Krishna. Yani dilimizin iki tane işi var aslında. Preşerde omurlandırmak veya dili incelmek. But it's very difficult to control the tongue. Ama dili kontrol etmek çok zor. So sometimes we may speak impulsively and not even think about the consequences. Bazen tepkisel bir şekilde konuşabiliriz ve bunun sonuçlarını hiç düşünmeyebiliriz bile. Of course, sometimes we may later, re- later regret it. Tabii sonradan bu için pişmanlık duyabiliriz bazen. And usually we later regret it when we see that their consequences are falling on me. Ve tabii sonuçlarını bize zarar verdiğini gördüğümüzde özellikle bazen pişmanlık duyabiliriz. Then we regret it. Yani bunu görürsek o zaman yeah, pişman olmalıyız. Yani böyle düşünürüz, bunu söylememeliyiz çünkü bunun benim için kötü sonuçları oldu. So, if we were spontaneously attracted always to speaking about Krishna, then obviously these these statements would not come from our mouths. Yani tabii ki biz her zaman Krishna hakkında konuşmaya spontane bir şekilde eğilim duyuyorsak o zaman bu sözler ağzımızdan çıkmayacaktır. But because it's the nature of the tongue which is uncontrolled as soon as we get together we look for topics to talk about and we start talking about others. Ama kontrol etmemiş ki dilin doğası bu olduğu için biz bir araya geldiğimizde bu eğilim ortaya çıkıyor ve diğerleri hakkında konuşmaya başlıyoruz. So we should know when to speak about others and when to restrain. O yüzden ne zaman başkaları hakkında konuşabileceğimizi ve ne zaman da konuşmamamız gerektiğini bilmeliyiz. And this is what Bhakti Vinod Thakur has talked about. And this is what I'm going to read from Bhakti Yaloka. Bhakti Yaloka'dan, Bhakti Vinod Thakur'dan bunları, bunun hakkında aslında okuyacağız. So, we will begin reading from Bhakti Yaloka. Şimdi Bhakti Yaloka'yı okumaya başlayalım. Just, uh, there's two sections where he speaks on this topic. İki tane bölüm var bu kitapta, bu konu üzerine konuştuğu. One section it was an essay which he wrote about Darya, or Darya means patience. Bir bölümde Darya hakkında konuşuyor, yani sabır hakkında konuşuyor. And he explains that a practitioner, a sadaka, of bhakti yoga, he must be very patient. Ve o bir sadakanın, yani bhakti yoga pratiği yapan bir kişinin çok sabırlı olması gerektiğini söylüyor. And uh, he said, the people don't have this quality of patience, they become very restless. And so by a quality of patience, the practitioner first controls himself, and then he can control the whole world. This in itself is a very there's a lot of detail I could give just to, on that topic alone. <laughs> he quotes the verse, well-known verse, Vacho Vegam Manasakora Vegam, Jiva Vegam Udora Pasta Vegam. That a person who can tolerate the urge to speak, <laughs> the mind's demands, the actions of anger and the, and the urges of the tongue, belly and genitals is is qualified to make disciples all over the world. This is also from Rupa Goswami. <coughs> so first he talks about the urge to speak. And this is what he says in this section about the urge to speak. He said when a person has a desire to speak more, he becomes very talkative. And he says if speech is not regulated, then enmity arises from talking about others. We already talked about this yesterday. 
Enmity will arise because we're so prone to immediately speak about others and then others find out about it and they, they become very angry. Why did you say that about me? You didn't even ask me first. And sometimes the devotees will say something like, I can understand if what you said was true, but if you would have asked me, you would have found out that <laughs> it was something completely different than what you said, what you said about me. Sometimes the devotees, I, I call it the tendency of playing, trying to play super soul. <laughs> that we sometimes try to we try to think that we know actually what the person's motive was, even though we don't know. He might have done something because of for a completely different reason, but we've already assuming the worst. This <laughs> I know why he did it. <laughs> Playing super soul. Know the hearts of the persons on what, what they do, and therefore we draw our own conclusions. I remember this is it's kind of a mundane example, but I think it's a good example. I remember once I was glancing through this book somebody showed me. And the author was writing about a paradigm shift. You know what a paradigm shift is? So he was giving as an example of a man who was uh, sitting on the subway. Metro, yes. And all of a sudden the, the door opened to the metro and one gentleman walked in with three children. And the man sat down on, in the seat of the metro and his children were wild. And the man who was sitting down in the seat watched this man walk in with three children and he wasn't even looking at his children. And he couldn't figure out why isn't he doing something to control his children? This is a public place. They're acting so wild and he's just sitting there looking off in the distance. So, so he was so angry, he couldn't take it anymore. So he said to the gentleman, Do you see what your children are doing? Yeah. And he opened Oh, maybe you've read this book before. Yes. Oh, really? <laughs> I never, I never read the book. <laughs> I just saw somebody was showing me the example. <laughs> so, he, well, then you all know the punchline. <laughs> I see everybody shake their heads. <laughs> so the man said, "Oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. We just came from the hospital, and their mother died." So, of course, the man, he was so angry, immediately, he understood. <laughs> one, one moment he was ready to punch the, the guy, and the next moment he's ready to take him in his arms and embrace him. <laughs> so that's what happens when we try to play super soul. We don't know sometimes why somebody did something, and we always try to to assume the worst. Yani <laughs> 
Their wives are yours. Just like Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, oh no, no, Prabhupada said, like the bee who goes to the for the flower, the nectar. Instead of like the flies who go to the source. So, of course, sometimes we have this tendency to be like flies. But we should try to think before we say something if we really don't know the facts. So this is the point that he's making here. He says if we don't control the urge to speak, then enmity is created. So then he says uh, to speak uselessly is the business of a fool. Then he says, but out of a desire to unnecessary, uh, uh, excuse me, but out of a desire to unnecessarily, necessarily engage in speech, the materialists always waste time and face so many distresses. And he says that pious people, when they understand this tendency, they, they observe mauna. And the practitioners of devotional service, they should not speak unnecessarily. He says if you have to speak unnecessarily, better to just keep quiet. And then he talks that topics of Krishna are, can always be talked about. Speak about favorable topics of devotional service is uh, is always necessary. But all other topics will be counted in the category of the urge to speak. The one who is able to control the urge to speak is a sober person. Then in the section on on the, in the, where he talks about Pajalpa, Bhakti Vinod Thakur expands what is Pajalpa. And he says talking with one another is called Jalpana or Pajalpa. He said, but nowadays in this godless world, people are inclined to godless talk. He said, but on the other hand, there's many positive topics that can be discussed about. Kirtan, offering prayers, citing scriptures, they're all called jalpana. And when these are performed with a favorable mood, they are all cultivation of Krishna consciousness. <laughs> this can be expanded on because someone may say, that's really, really restrictive. How do I only open my mouth to speak on those topics? And later in this section, he's going to explain that householders do have to speak about others. It's the very nature of being a householder that you have to speak about others. <coughs> but still, it can be regulated in a way where there's no malice. But he said also, he explains, uh, let me read right here. Godless projelpers are impediments to devotional service. It's highlighted in yellow. Okay, okay. Uh, 
Tane, tanesiz olan parçalar adamla hizmetin önündeki engellerdir. There are many types. Bunun birçok e, şekli vardır, türü vardır. Useless talks. Gereksiz konuşmalar. Arguments. Tartışmalar. Gossip. Dedikodu. Debates. Münazaralar. Fault finding in others. Başkalarına hata bulmak. Speaking falsehoods. Doğru olmayan şeyler, doğru olmayan şeyler söylemek. Blaspheming devotees. Adananları aşağılamak. They are all worldly talk and are called prajapa. Ve bütün dünyayı konuşmaları prajapa So he's going to expand on this list. Yani bu, bu listeyi biraz açacak sanırım. Okay. What is worldly talks and what is worldly prajapa? And what is devotional pajalpa? Yani dünyevi pajalpa nedir? E, spiritual pajalpa nedir? Bunu açacak. He talks about what is useless talk. İlk olarak gereksiz konuşma ne oldu hakkında konuşuyor. And he says it's very extremely detrimental to one's spiritual life. Ve bunun bir kişinin spiritual hayatı için çok e, zarar verici bir şey olduğunu söylüyor. Devotees should be practicing discussing topics related to Krishna. We talked a little bit about that yesterday. When we talked about how a devotee uh, always thinks about Krishna by regulating his life so that every day he is either thinking or speaking or hearing about Krishna. Okuyacak, konuşacak ve düşünecek şekilde nasıl organize etmesi gerektiğini anlatmıştık. When we talked about the verse, uh, uh, uh, what is it? Smart them, yes. Smart them, yes. Ve bir kıtadan bahsetmiştik. Satın tam bir şey olmuş. Satın tam bir şey olmuş. Satın tam bir şey olmuş. Satın tam bir şey olmuş. Satın tam bir şey olmuş. That Krishna must always be remembered and he should never be forgotten. Krishna her zaman hatırlanmalı ve hiçbir zaman unutulmamalıdır. And we explain how always the word satatam in this verse means every day. And we talked about Krishna, how Krishna also said that if you can't always think of me, then every day you should regulate your life around thinking about me. So the more devotees are regulated in such topics, then immediately brings a decrease of mundane topics. Of course, what really makes matters worse, what can, can really make this situation worse, is that when devotees get together to discuss, discuss Krishna and they end up just arguing with each other. <laughs> that, that's somehow missing the point. <laughs> because one of the topics of Pajalpur is arguments. There are transcendental arguments. But there are also useless arguments. Especially useless arguments which are simply born of the desire to argue for argument's sake. I could give you an example. Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya was known as Nimai Pandit. He was the greatest scholar. He was expert in logic and argument. He was so expert in logic and argument that he would get into arguments with everybody and would defeat them. And after he would defeat them with his argument, and the people would accept, yes, your argument is perfect, they understand it. Then he, then he would defeat his own argument and establish a different conclusion. And he would convince them, yes. That's right. Why did you say that? 
geldi onlarda. Nasıl bunu görebilir? And then after they did that, then he would take that argument and defeat it and bring it back to the original argument. Ve sonra onlar buna ikna olduklarında da tekrar onların argümanı, bu argümanı da alt edip en baştaki düşünceye dönüp dönerdi. Because in Navadweep at the time, everybody was trained in Nyaya, learning logic and argument. Çünkü Navadweep, Navadweep'te o zaman herkes Nyaya konusunda eğitim, eğitim, eğitimliydi. Yani mantık konusunda ve tanıdık. Everybody would like getting into arguments and establishing the truth based on argument. Herkes böyle binazlara girmeyi ve bunlara dayanarak gerçeği ortaya koymayı çok seviyordu. Sometimes they would get into arguments saying that my teacher is better than your teacher. Bazen böyle tartışmalara giriyorlardı. Benim öğretmenim senin öğretmeninden daha iyi. And they get into arguments about this. So much logic and argument. And the Vaishnavas who were present at the time used to see young Nimai Pandit engage in so much argument. The Vaishnavas would think Nimai is so intelligent. Başlarından şöyle düşünüyorlar. Nimai çok akıllı. So attractive. Çok çekici. Everyone's attractive to him. Herkes ona çekim duyuyor. He has so many good qualities. Onun bu kadar çok güzel bir dediği var. If only he would give up these arguments and become a devotee, we would, I would surrender myself completely to him. Yani eğer o sadece bu tartışmaya göre bir adana olsaydı, ben kendimi tamamıyla ona teslim ederdim diyorlar. And the reason why he did that, it was a part of his mission. Because everybody was so much attached to logic and argument, he wanted to show them he was the best. And they, they all became so attached to him, they wanted to become his student. And when he became, when he became his student, of course, he went and visited Gaya and he met his spiritual master, Ishwar Puri. And when he met his spiritual master, Ishwar Puri, he came back to Navadweep and he completely changed. And his students were coming and expecting to hear about Nyaya and all he could speak was explain everything in logic, in grammar, everything related to Krishna, and he would only speak about Krishna. So they, they became so attracted to him that when, when young Nimai said, okay, let's tie up the books, we don't need this anymore. They all became his followers and they all became devotees. And all the Vaishnavas, they all surrendered themselves to Nimai. Because they could see what is the use of all of this arguments and logic and arguments. If it's if it's not centered on Krishna. So sometimes the devotees they come together to hear a chant about Krishna and instead they just argue with each other. I know better than you. <laughs> and sometimes they even argue. Both sides will say, Prabhupada said. <laughs> and they'll spend the whole class. Prabhupada said this. Well, Prabhupada said that. <laughs> Prabhupada said this. Prabhupada said that. Everybody is so agitated. <laughs> that everybody's arguing, but nobody's consciousness is being uplifted. <laughs> Arguments. We should not argue for argument's sake. We should be very careful to not argue for argument's sake. We should try to fix our mind and understanding what is Siddhanta, yes. 
Ve biz zihnimizde yani <gülüyor> anlayışımızda buna odaklamayız. Farklı zidatının ne olduğunu I could give a whole class on this, but it's probably after the book. <laughs> and, I, and I should read more. Useless arguments. <laughs> of course, we have a tendency to think it's useful. <laughs> we haven't been able to yet define what is useless and useful. It's like sometimes devotees. Okay, here goes me. I go again. <laughs> so it's like sometimes devotees. Uh, they uh, they hear that everything we have should be used in Krishna's service. And everything is useful for Krishna's service. Then we start to think that. I need this, it's useful for Krishna service, I need that, I need this, I need that. <laughs> but the standard is, yes, everything is useful for maintaining body and soul together. So devotees sometimes ask the question, how do I know what I need? The difference between what do I need and what do I want? Because as far as I can see, everything is useful, so I might as well have everything. <laughs> and therefore we spend more time getting at everything first and then forgetting about how is to be utilized for Krishna service? <laughs> so sometimes we have a hard time discriminating between what is useful and what is useless. <laughs> Therefore, Rupa Goswami says one of the causes of fall down is to endeavoring for mundane achievements, which are very difficult to attain. For Krishna, we're ready to undergo any inconvenience. I remember I was once on traveling second time with a god brother of mine. And uh, he had, for lunch, he had a little container of yogurt. And he didn't know how to eat it. Because he didn't have a spoon. <laughs> so he started to go different places how he could find a spoon. He went into the supermarket and he saw that the only way he could get a spoon was he had to buy a big plastic package of spoons. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't want to waste Krishna's Lakshmi. <laughs> so he refused to buy the big package of spoons. <laughs> so he went go around looking for other shops. Where was the spoon? <laughs> and he said he spent so much time, about 30 minutes, looking for a shop that would have a, one plastic spoon, so we didn't have to waste Krishna's Lakshmi. And when he sat down and he had the spoon, he realized, what did I just do? Because <laughs> he realized he, he could take the lid off the container of the yogurt and just use the lid for a spoon. <laughs> and he said, now I know what Rupa Goswami was talking about. <laughs> Endeavoring for mundane achievements, which are very difficult to obtain. <laughs> I spent so much time looking for a spoon and I had one right here. <laughs> and so I thought it was a very telling example. We don't know the difference between what's needed and what we want. 
So the same thing with about arguments. We don't know what's needed and what we want. En als je gaat schmeissen, dan geeft zij de nee komt me zeker en nee komt me wat ik doe. And sometimes we spend so much time in useless arguments. Ja, maar dan dan geef ik ze daar schmeissen op de man kan je doen. In fact, the other day we just gave class in Budapest on on Vyasadev and Narada Muni, and Narada Muni was telling Vyasadev, you've given so much room for argument in the Vedanta. You should simply give your own commentary because everybody else will argue and give different commentaries. <laughs> because Vedanta Sutra was just simply sutras, they're small codes. Said, people will read these sutras and they'll just try to interpret in different ways and people will give different commentary. Such as Sari Rakabhasya, the commentary of Shankaracharya. <laughs> With an impersonal conclusion. Of course, but many of the Vaishnavas, they also gave their commentaries. Four different Sampradayas, they gave their commentaries. Baladev Vijibhushan in our Sampradaya, he gave his commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. But the point was, is anticipating that people will simply argue. You should just give them glorify Krishna's pastimes. Yeah, and nearly Narada Muni got to the root of Vyasadev's despondency. And he said to Vyasadev, you should give your own commentary on Vedanta Sutra. Yeah, that's what Srimad Bhagavatam is. So, useless talk. Then, argument we talked about. Uh, then, he also says, useless arguments arise from envy or pride. Aversion or attachment to sense gratification. Or foolishness or self pride. Quarrelsome people also become intoxicated by useless arguments. Kind of intoxication. And people become. It's a good, good example. Become intoxicated by useless arguments. <laughs> Therefore, he says, while discussing topics of the Lord and his devotees, the practicing devotee should always be careful to avoid useless arguments. <laughs> then he says, now he's talking about gossip. Talking without reason about other people is extremely adverse to devotional service. Many people talk about others to establish their own reputation. Being envious, some people are accustomed to discuss others' character. We spoke about this yesterday, the next sentence. The minds of those who are busy in such topics can never be fixed on the lotus feet of Krishna. Talking about others should be rejected in all respects. But in the practice of devotional service, there are many favorable topics that are faultless 
even though they are above others. I'm not going to be able to read this, I'm going to just give a quick summary to it. And he gives three different examples. He said, when the spiritual master is instructing his disciples, sometimes he has to speak about others. And he can speak about others in a very general way. He can speak about others in a more specific way. And he may speak about others even in a very specific way. And he gives different examples from Shastra. He says the reason why is the spiritual master he has to do this is because he has to help the disciples understand what not to do. And therefore he may have to point out in a general way, don't be like this. Sugadeva Swami, he gives the example, Sugadeva Swami in the Bhagavatam. He talks about envious householders who spend all night sleeping and all and, and, and uh, all night sleeping and having sex and all day working for it. He's speaking about others, but in a general way. What? Don't be like this. <laughs> There's a better way to live than to be like this. So sometimes in order to make a point more clear, such references have to be given. Then sometimes even a more specific reference has to be given. And he gives the example of Lord Chaitanya once made a very strong statement. He made a very strong statement about Chota Haridas. But he didn't mention his name. He just made a strong statement because he had to make the point very clear for the benefit of others. Don't be like this. He was specifically speaking about pseudo renunciates. Those who want to externally appear to be like a renunciate, but are not internally renounced. So Lord Chaitanya made a statement. <coughs> he says, I cannot tolerate seeing the face of a person who has accepted the renounced order of life. But who still talks intimately with a woman. But of course he's speaking about intimate discussions. He says there are many persons with little in their possession. Who accept the renounced order of life like monkeys. And he says my mind is not under my control. It does not like to see anyone in the renounced order who talks intimately with women. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur uses this as another example. That he's pointing out something so that pseudo renunciants understand you can't do this and get away with it. So he has to speak about others. There are another another example about having to speak about others, but I won't go into it. It was an example given in the Bhagavatam specifically about King Vena. 
Bu da bakalım tam da verilen bir örnek ve ve kral Wayne ile ilgili. And everyone should know who King Wayne was. He was not very qualified king. Yani herkes de tanıyorsanız King Wayne'i pek nitelikli bir kral değildi. So he says that Maitreya Rishi needed to speak about others in this way to instruct them. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing. So okay. If you go there, you won't get it. Okay. Maitreya Rishi needed to speak about others in this way to instruct them. And this is not Pajalpa. Uh, but those who talk about others while influenced by devotional impediments like envy hatred pride or distinction they are offenders at the feet of Bhakti Devi in other words if we're going to speak about others As Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, we should look first look within ourselves. <laughs> Is my heart free from envy? Is my heart free from pride? Is my heart free from hatred? Is my heart freed from the desire for distinction? If it's not, and if I'm a sadaka, and if I'm a sadaka, and if I'm honest with myself, maybe I shouldn't be talking like this. We should think about this before we speak about others. This is a sadaka. A sadaka is somebody who thinks about these things before he begins to speak about others. And when he becomes practiced in this, his mind becomes more peaceful. He can think more about Krishna. And think more about advancing in devotional service. You can think more about seeing the good qualities in devotees. Instead of like being the fly that always goes to the source. We can be like the bee that always goes to the nectar. We can be happy in the association of devotees. Because Prabhupada says they are the best on the planet. They have come to serve Krishna. They are the best on the planet. They may have so many faults, but they're washing their hands. They're chanting Hare Krishna. They're associating with devotees. They're reading Srimad Bhagavatam. And they don't become disturbed when they hear topics like this. This is a sincere sadhaka. Somebody who's insincere, they'll become so disturbed. You mean I can't be a fault finder anymore? No, how am I going to live? I have nothing to talk about. No way to, to, to look good in front of others. You're trying to smash my my ego? I'm not doing it. He's doing it to all of us. He had to deal with it so long ago. So did Srila Bhakti Siddhartha, so did Srila Prabhupada. And we simply accept it. 
And become sadhakas. Always aspiring for advancing in Krishna consciousness. There will be some taste. It is associating with devotees. Imagine associating devotees and your mind just doesn't think of any faults. Every day. And you become more happy to do it. Imagine how nice it would be. Of course, it's something to aspire for. But our chayas are giving us help. Kaviraj Goswami says, the path is very difficult. And I am blind. And my feet are slipping again and again. And therefore I pray to the saints to grant me their mercy stick for my support. To grant me their stick of mercy. Just like if you're climbing a mountain and your feet are slipping again and again. If somebody gives you a stick, then you can move forward. The Vaishnava saints are granting us this stick of mercy for our support. So even though our feet may slip again and again, if we take that mercy stick, we can move forward. That is their kindness. That is their mercy. I'm going to stop here. I think I went a little bit late. Yeah. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.